Are you home food? No. All right, good evening. Welcome to the Randolph County Heritage Museum. And our third our third speaker of the series. Tonight, uh, we are glad to have George Jerry with us. And he has been our speaker here before. Many of you know who he is, but he is an investigative journalist and an author. He's covered high-profile crime, politics, business, education, and features and other stories in Northeast Arkansas for many years. He's worked for newspapers in Jonesboro, uh, all the way to Mountain Home. Uh, he's won 11 first place awards for reporting with the Associated Press Managing Editors and the Arkansas Press Association. He has also written two uh, true crime books, Witches in West Memphis and The Creekside Bones. I believe he's spoken about at least one of those here. And so I'm going to turn it over to him and let him talk about his newest topic. I'm actually about to finish my third true crime book. It's called, it's, the working title is A Whisper in the Willows, Who Killed Amanda Tessing? And so um, I'm going to get into that here in a minute. Um, first off, I, before we start the, talking about some of these murder cases that I'm going to talk about in my next book, um, I have to tell you this story, and when I get done with it, you'll understand why. So I don't just cover murders, you know, and stuff like that. I cover a lot of different topics. And so I went to the Memphis Film Festival uh, probably about, I guess it was probably the first part of June. And um, by the way, this is the biggest ego trip story you will ever hear somebody tell. Okay? <laughs> so I went to interview Patrick Wayne, who was the youngest son of John Wayne, you know, the actor. And Patrick was a big time actor back in his day, too. He um, uh, was in line to be Superman at one point and when Christopher Reeves got it. And uh, he, he, was a, he was the host of that show, Tic Tac Doe. Anybody remembers that? And so I was there to interview him. And then there was another guy named Christopher Mitchum, who um, is the son of Robert Mitchum, you know, the old time, uh, famous uh, old timey actor. And then Robert Carradine was there. Uh, he was the Revenge of the Nerds guy. He, was, he played Lewis. And uh, his dad, John Carradine, is, um, he, is the, he was the guy who, who, the preacher in The Grapes of Wrath. And he was a big time actor too. So I'm there to interview these guys who are basically the sons of great actors, I guess you could say. And um, as I'm walking around this film festival, I noticed like people I kind of vaguely recognized from here to there. And I'm like, I see a guy, and uh, the first guy I noticed was the doctor from The Love Boat. <laughs> oh, wow. He's 200 years old, and he's still running around. <laughs> I saw a guy named uh, Robert Fuller. I'm not sure you guys yeah. are know him. I mean, it was a line of women out the door to get his autograph. And he was charging like 45 bucks each one. I was like, man. So maybe I need to get into that. Uh, whatever he does. So I'm walking around. And I've got two friends with me because they've got some posters. They want some of these guys to sign. And I had no idea who was going to be there. Well, this woman walks up to me. And she goes, um, I just want to tell you I think you're handsome and well-dressed. Okay. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. And I shook her hand. I said, you made my day. I said, that never happens to me. So um, my two friends are behind me, and they both just stopped walking. And I'm like, what? And one of my friends said something with an explicative in it that starts uh, with, it starts with what, and it's, the next word starts with an F. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, go, uh, I go, what? And he goes, did you not know who that was? I said, no. And he goes, that's Donna Wells. She played Marianne on the show Gilligan. Oh, wow. I had a crush on her when I was a kid. Oh, wow. so I, I told those guys, I said, all these autographs I got that day, I said, I have the best thing that ever happened in this place. And my head was gigantic. I went to a dinner party the next night with a bunch of people I went to high school with over at the Lake and Horseshoe Bend. And I got up on a picnic table, and there was 40 or 50 people there. And I said, I'm going to tell every one of you this story individually at least three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's my big ego true story that I tell everybody now. My daughter's getting sick and tired of hearing it by the time. <laughs> so um, I want to start off by um, telling you another story. Um, and it, it goes back 18 years. 
and um, the year was 2000. I don't know if you guys remember or not. We were not even supposed to make it that far because of Y2K. We were supposed to wipe yeah. us out. Um, the internet was, believe it or not, the internet was only about six years old. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the social media stuff that we have now and a lot of this other stuff. And um, I remember uh, June of 2000 for personal reasons because I had uh, a wisdom tooth cut out of my face <laughs> and they had me knocked out. And um, my wife and my sister decided after they got done picking me up at the uh, oral surgeon that they would decide they want to go to Lazari's and eat lunch and left me in the car passed out. <laughs> well, well um, I woke say. up and didn't know where I was at or what I was doing. And so I got out of the car and I went into the restaurant. I mean, I was out. I sat at a table and started eating somebody else's lunch. Oh. <laughs> somebody I didn't even know. So, oh. next thing I know, my sister comes over. She puts her arm around me. She goes, this is at your table. And I'm like, okay. So she takes me to her table. Well, I remember that day very well. Uh, not very well, but I remember it because having the tooth extracted in that horrible, embarrassing moment. And I also remember it because it was extremely stormy that day. It was just raining and all the time. And um, later on that night, there was a girl named Amanda Tussing who was at her boyfriend's house, a guy named Matt Urban. And she was at his house, and um, she was in school. She was from a little town called Dell. And she decided that night that she was going to go home to her parents' house, and then because she had college classes the next day, and it was just closer for her to go from their house to college. And so she promised her boyfriend, who was her fiance, by the way, she said, I promise I'll call when I get there. So she gets in her car and leaves off into the dark, stormy night. Well, about an hour and a half, two hours later, uh, rolls by, and she hasn't called. And so he calls her dad and says, hey, is she made it yet? And he goes, no. Now, they kind of surmise that because of the storm, you know, that maybe she had to drive slow, might have had to pull over, you know, pretty reasonable stuff. But after about two hours, you know, it's about a 45-minute to an hour drive from his apartment to where her parents lived, they just, the father got worried, boyfriend got worried, so they decided they were going to drive from opposite ends and try to see if they could find her. So um, when they, uh, about halfway from, uh, about the midway point between his apartment and Dell, they find her car on the side of the road. And her car is like underneath a, like a, like a light, and like a street light. And um, they go up to the car, and the keys were still in the ignition. The car was in perfect running order. The windshield wipers were mid-slap. Um, the... Um, that she had a cold beverage still sitting in the container in the, in the console, and her seat was moved all the way up. She was kind of short. It's kind of, uh, uh, she, she, she's only about five feet tall, and I'm told that her twin brother is like six feet tall. He's like huge, and she's like really small. And um, so, um, and the radio was turned down just a little bit. Like, you know, kind of, it was on her favorite station, just turned down just a little bit. And um, so they became obviously very concerned, so they called the police. And over the next four days, they, they searched for her, uh, found no trace of her. Well, then finally, a couple was driving out, um, and I don't, I don't know if that tributary is, uh, uh, you might know the name of that area where they Big found her. Big Hitch Yeah. It's, it's, it's just off the St. Francis River, um, and uh, it's uh, kind of a desolate area. Well, a couple saw a body floating in the water. Um, mm. When they found her, she was still wearing the hat on her head that she had had when she left her boyfriend. Um, fully closed. Um, it, it was a bizarre murder. Um, they didn't know exactly how she died. They knew immediately it was homicide. She didn't just wander. And she was found 11 miles away from her car. And um, any, if you ever talk to like an FBI profiler or something like that, they'll tell you that typically when somebody murders someone else, they'll take them about 10 miles. That's kind of like the mental breaking point for them. And they'll dump the body. So they usually find the body within 10 miles of, of the murder, so, uh, where the murder occurred. So the autopsy comes back about a month later, and she hadn't been sexually assaulted. Um, she died from, uh, uh, like, drowning, but it wasn't, it wasn't drowning. It was like symptoms, uh, symptoms like drowning. And what that means is that she didn't necessarily, her lungs weren't necessarily infused with a bunch of water. Sometimes when you go into water quickly, um, 
a mucus plug will form in your throat and you can't breathe. So you don't, the, the water pressure causes it to stay to where you can't breathe, but it, a lot of the water doesn't get in your lungs. And so um, anyway, it was baffling to say the least. So they started going through all these different lines of thought. Okay, the first thing that, that they thought of is drugs because, you know, um, that, that, that artery, those, um, that travel route, a lot of drugs go through there. And of course, uh, they thought maybe it was just random. You know, maybe they, she, some druggies thought that this was some rant, you know, this was a, somebody else's car, and then they stop her, they figure it out as her, and then they kill her, which that didn't make any sense because if you know anything about druggies, they don't, uh, they're not going to drown you. They're going to, they'll shoot you and chop you up, do all sorts of horrible things to you. So that made no sense. They followed those, those leads for years, and they never led anywhere substantial. They never found anything. And also, there's also kind of a phenomenon, and I've talked about this before, where like in a in, in the drug culture, um, a lot of times people will try to get like I use the word street cred by taking credit for an unsolved crime, especially murders, because it makes them seem makes those people seem scary, and it happens all the time. I mean, you'll have uh, when our West Memphis Three, you know, I tell people all the time, Jesse Miss Kelly wasn't the only person who confessed to that one. I mean, a bunch of people did. So anyway, um, so they followed that, um, that line for a while, and it just didn't make any, it, even just to me, make, makes no sense, because there's just no indication, there's no reason to think that it was drug involved, because obviously she wasn't a druggie, you know. Um, she was a basketball player, captain of her basketball team at one time. Um, and so then the second mode of thought was maybe, and from everything I just told you guys, right now in your mind, I know that most of you are already thinking it if you didn't think it coming in here. It sounds like a police officer did it. And there was another piece of evidence that came out that made it even more striking. Um, they found her license in her front pocket. And so, um, the, but the second line of thinking was that it was a blue light rapist, that somebody, it was somebody who was impersonating a cop, they stop her, and, um, so then she, that's how they abduct her. Well, the problem with that theory is, and there could be some merit to it, uh, and, and you'll, you'll remember this, the original Blue Light Rapist was actually here in Arkansas, um, a couple, but it was a couple years before this incident. It was back in 1997, I think, and the guy had raped, I think, four separate women. and he'd, you know, he'd stop them and um, take them off and then, and then rape them, but he was already in prison by then. And um, so I kind of went into <coughs> that aspect of, of it and say, okay, was there any reports of, uh, you know, like other women or other people getting stopped by a blue light rapist. And no one, there, been, there were no other reports. Um, I talked to the lead detective, he said, no, we got no reports of anybody else being stopped. So, um, and also there was a, another key part of the autopsy that also didn't square with that fact because the point of a blue light rapist is to rape the victim. I mean, that's his, that's his motive. He's going to rape her. And so um, she wasn't raped. And um, so that made no sense to me. Um, there's no evidence for it, so I kind of slid that one to the side. So the next obvious, you know, an, ob an obvious suspect in any crime is a spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, that type of thing. That's always, the, you know, 99% of the time, that's the person who did it. So, they, so I started, you know, um, researching, you know, her boyfriend or her fiancé. And literally, you can go back to the newspaper accounts from days and weeks after it happened and the sheriff was, was very vehement that he had he didn't think he, this kid had anything to do with the murder. And also, you know, a, a reason I don't think he did, just off the top, is that generally if you if I go out and commit a crime like this, I'm not the one who calls the police and tells them, hey, or alerts them that this person's missing. And, um, and I was telling some people out in the hallway, you know, they, inter they interrogated him multiple times um, and he he did something that any one of us would do. If you have somebody that you're concerned with, they're driving out at night, you know, they're going to be driving about an hour away, how much time do you give them before you call and say, hey, did you make it? Give them an hour and a half. That's exactly what he called. Um, and then at the two-hour mark, he leaves his house and goes and tries to find her with her dad. So he did everything that you would expect him to do. And then um, one of the detectives who works on the case, actually he's retiring, I believe, next week, maybe this week. Uh, it might be this week. Um, they were in Little Rock, him and another detective. So, and this guy worked in Little Rock. Um, he married, 
eventually went on, got married, and did all this. Well, they went into his office one day, just out of the blue, and said, hey, you know, what's going on? They sat down and talked to him. Well, then they um, said, would you go take a polygraph test? And he said, yes, I will. And so he goes, and they take a polygraph test. The polygraph guy comes out and says, that guy's telling you the truth. He had nothing to do with it. And so that kind of eliminated, you know, that person as a suspect for me. So then finally we get down to what, where the facts lead us. Okay, and I am the first to admit, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna admit. I remember some of you were here last year when I spoke about this case. Um, I have a different theory in this case now, um, and I'm gonna talk about it. Um, so the facts of the case are these: her car is found in perfect mechanical working order. Her license is found in her front pocket. The radio is turned down, not off. The car seat is moved all the way to the front. Um, there's still a cold drink in, in the container. Every windshield wipers, mid slap, she's underneath the light. Everything tells you that she was stopped by a legitimate police officer. Okay? And so, um, and I, in my book, I talk about, you know, some potential suspects as far as the actual police officers that it could be. And, um, you know, um, because I think that that's probably the most likely case. It has to be. And, you know, a question that I would get a lot was, well, if you think it was a police officer, why, A, why did he stop her? And then B, why, you know, um, why did he just kill her? Because that's all that happened. And I think, and um, actually uh, one of Mandy's, uh, uh, a girl I play basketball with her and was friends with her, is here. I, there's a phenomenon that we don't talk about a lot that used to happen a lot. Um, and they've tried to do research about it, but it's hard to research because people don't like to talk about it. It's a phenomenon where women would get stopped late at night by police officers. They've been out, you know, they're young, they'd, be out, they'd go out to a club or something, and they'd be driving down, you know, a desolate road. And there's a true phenomenon where police officers, you know, rogue police officers, would try to find these, these spots where they could go out and stop girls and, and you know, hey, you know, uh, can you come back to my car for just a second? Hey, I know you've been drinking, you know, it's time to go to jail, or it's time to do something else. And a lot of girls just chose to do something else. And so... Um, and what I think may have happened in this case is the police officer may have stopped her thinking, you know, because she's small in stature, she's uh, everything I've ever heard about her, very friendly, nice young woman, maybe thinking that he could coerce her into doing something, not knowing that she was the captain of a basketball team and she would fight back. And at that point, there was only one problem then. She knew who he was. And he had to get rid of her. So... Anyway, I will, I will detail all that in my book, um, you know, and it's, it's tough. It's been 18 years. Um, I think in this state we've got to do something about these cold cases. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, um, the police can just say, hey, I'm, um, you know, we're still, we're still working this case, you know, we're still working it, so they don't have to turn the file over to the family. You know, it's like in this case, Rebecca Gould case, you know, um, her dad's a dentist over at Mountain Home. I mean, he would be more than happy to hire a gang of private investigators if they had the case file and go figure out who killed her. Um, but he doesn't have the case file, so they're just, you know, they're just spinning their tires, you know. So I think we need to, at some point, do something to where, you know, um, where the family can have access to the file at a certain point. And I get, you know, it, you know, the police want to keep it for a long time. They don't want to uh, um, destroy the integrity of their investigations. But at some point, there comes a magic moment when, 18, 19 years later, I really don't think anybody's investigating their case, okay? I mean, let's be real. They can say they are, but that's just not the case. So um, my next book, that will kind of be the lead story. Um, also, and I think I probably talked about this before, so I won't go into it much. Um, I'm going to have a couple chapters in there about some of the, I covered three of the four executions down on Arkansas's death row last year. Um, and I'm going to write, a, I'll, I'll have a few chapters about that, that whole experience. Um, I was down there for the first double execution, actually, in U.S., in the United States, and I think it was 20, 18 years, something like that. Um, and, you know, I get asked this question a lot, are you, like, pro-death penalty or against it? I tend to be a little bit against it just because I kind of have this thought in my head, is it worse to kill one innocent person than to let ten live like animals in a jail cell, you know? Um, but then you meet some of these monsters down there like um, Jack Jones, a guy who walked it. You guys might remember this story. He walked into a tax repairer's office in Searcy, and this is going to get really graphic, so get ready. Um, he walks into a tax repairer's office, and a woman's getting ready to take her daughter to the dentist. And uh, he walks in and says, hey, you gave me the wrong tax books this morning.
and she said, okay, well, he says, he pulls out what she thinks is a gun, I think it was actually a BB gun, um, he says, now I'm going to rob you, and so he takes the money out of uh, the cash register, then he takes the mom and ties her up, and then takes the little girl and ties her up in the bathroom, and then he goes back to the mom, and he violently, anally rapes her while he's choking her to death with a coffee pot. So then he goes back, the girl's in the room crying, and her name is Lacey, and so he goes back into the bathroom and he goes, she goes, please don't hurt my mom, he goes, don't worry about her, he goes, I'm here to hurt you now. He beats her so badly that when um, the police show up, they think she's dead, and they're just taking pictures, like, you know, just evidence pictures, and she wakes up. And so they take her, they perform an emergency surgery on her, she had shards of, like, skull in her brain that they had to pull out. Um, but she was able to survive, and then she was able to identify him as the suspect, and then he and he eventually admitted to what he did. Um, he actually actually killed another woman in Florida, and so I was there for his execution. One of the hardest parts of doing a job like this is dealing with family or asking a really tough question, because the night of his execution, Lacey was there. She was there at the execution, and she's a woman now. And I didn't want to do it. There was a lot of media from all over the world there. Um, they were astounded that we were killing, trying to kill eight people in like 12 days or whatever, uh, whatever that time frame was. So um, I was standing, she was standing kind of on the stage, and I was standing not very far from her. And I just had to ask her a question, because before he died in his statement, he said that he loved her like a daughter and that she saved his soul or something like that, saved his life. And um, he said he kept a picture of her bludgeoned body in his cell to remind him of what he did. And so um, I asked her the question, I said, he said that he loved you like a daughter. What do you, how do you feel about that? And literally, I, she literally, like she, it, she physically moved back when I asked the question because it bothered her so bad. And then she just went on a tirade about what a you know, terrible, horrible person he is. And after hearing that story, it's really hard for me to think that that guy, we're not better off for him not being here. You know, I mean, to be totally honest with you. Um, so anyway, um, one of the reasons that I don't have my book completed yet, my third one, is because uh, I've been working on this case again. Uh, I was telling somebody, I literally, before I got here, I was on the phone with a producer from Dateline. Um, they're wanting to do um, a show about this. And what kind of got this rekindled for me, and for those of you who don't know the story, I'll tell you really quickly, this was the first murder case I ever covered. It was, it's unsolved. The woman's name is Rebecca Gould. Um, she was a 22-year-old college student who disappeared from her house, or from a friend's house, on September 20th, 2004. Um, a week later, they found her body out in out in the woods, um, just off of Highway 9, um, <coughs> connecting Melbourne to Mountain View. Um, I was out there the day they found her. Um, I'm the one that told her dad that they found his daughter. And so. Um, so over the next 14 years, you know, I've written about this case in both my books. I've written lots of newspaper articles about it. Um, she, she died from a single blow to the head. Uh, she wasn't sexually assaulted. Um, not a lot of injuries to her body. So I get an email, I think it was in February maybe, from a reporter from the Discovery Channel. And she wanted to do a podcast series on this case. So I met her in Hardy and we started talking about it. Well, I think I told you guys last time I was here that, um, and, and I, you know what, I may be wrong about this, I may not have told you this, but I always kind of had a su suspicion that it was, like, possibly a female had done it, because she wasn't sexually assaulted, It's she was struck in the face, um, I heard a lot of rumors that she'd been getting into, she'd gotten into it with some girls over a, a boyfriend, you know, that kind of deal, and so I thought maybe, because what happened was that she took her, she took the guy that she was sort of dating to work, she went back to his house because she was getting ready to go back to Fayetteville. She was going to college there. It was a Monday morning. So um, my suspicion was is that maybe you know some girls broke in. And also there was other details like the mattress was flipped. That was, there was a blood-covered mattress that was flipped. There were uh, sheets in the washing machine. Somebody tried to clean it up. And most guys I know, I mean, especially you know guys who commit murder, they ain't cleaning up a mess. They're getting out of there. So it just seemed like a logical thing to me. Um, but then, you know, there's some other things about it that didn't make sense as far as that goes, though. Because in her autopsy report, she didn't have any, like, defensive wounds on her hands. And 
I would think, you know, and I could be wrong about this, but just uh, as a layman, I would think that if a girl broke in or a couple girls, because I always thought maybe it was a couple, they would be more than one hit. They wouldn't have just hit her one time in the face. They would have hit her a bunch of times. And so when you put, if you, when you take the facts that I just told you and put them into a vacuum, it's obviously somebody that she was dating, it would seem, just from the facts. If you, if you take out, you know, alibis and all that other stuff, it would seem that way because somebody walked in there, they were so mad at her because what I think, and I told her dad, this is what happened to her. She dropped a friend off, she goes back to his house, she stopped off at a convenience store and bought a biscuit. It was still in the microwave when the police searched the house. So what happened was is she went back in the house, she put the biscuit in the microwave, decided to take a nap before she left. Um, she was only she was wearing a shirt and her, and her panties. Um, and, I, and again, I told the Dateline producer today, you know, he said, she goes, well, there's no evidence that she got raped. I said, no, there was no forensic evidence in the autopsy report. And um, here's the thing about rapists. They don't generally put your underwear back on after they murder you. I mean, that's just not what they're going to do. So um, I told her dad, I said, what happened was, and, and you could, the, the wound is to one side of her head as if she's laying like on a pillow. I said what happened was somebody went into the house and she was killed with a piano leg. And inside the house she was at, there was a piano. It's missing a leg now and it had a loose leg. So whoever killed her, I mean, did they just randomly out of four legs decide to pick out the one that was loose? I mean, come on, that doesn't make any sense. So um, I think it's someone who had intimate knowledge of the house and her habits and somebody who had a definitely emo an emotional attachment to it. Now the guy, um, the friend she dropped off at work was a guy named Casey McCullough. He's never, been, he was a suspect in the case and then they, they cleared him and they said he had an alibi. And so, um, and I've talked to Casey a couple times, I've interviewed him before, and um, you know, he talked, the first couple times he talked to me, now he doesn't. He won't return my calls at all. And so, that makes me suspicious. You know, if you talk to me one time and now you won't talk to me, that that's you know that's suspicious. But again, um, I would never accuse anybody of a crime they didn't commit. Um, but just put, pointing those facts out. So to make a long story short, the reason I'm not done is I wasn't going to do a chapter on this case again. But now the Discovery Channel is coming out with a nine-part podcast series on it, starting in October. And um, I'm actually working with that Discovery Channel reporter. I actually talked to her again today too. So um, I feel like I needed to put it on hold just a little bit, get another chapter kicked out, put together some of these facts. And also, I'm going to do something <coughs> that no one in the history of the world has ever done. I'm going to admit I was wrong because I thought it was something else. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, and he's going to admit he's wrong. <laughs> have, you, are you, have you been wrong too? <laughs> oh, I said I, I was admitting that I was wrong about something. <laughs> very rarely happens for anybody. Um, and so another chapter in the book that I'm, I'm working on right now, um, it's actually done, and it involves a woman from Pocahontas, uh, Karen Swift. And um, it's a really, this case really... It's a bizarre case to me because there is literally, when you go to do, like I go to, I still go to the library and do research a lot and I'll get old newspapers out when I'm starting to work on a, a case. And I wrote about it when it happened. I mean, I, I talked to her son even when she was missing. Um, one of her sons, his name is Dustin. I'm sure some of y'all know exactly who the family I'm talking about. And um, I talked to him when she disappeared. Um, I wrote stories about it. Um, it is a peculiar case to me because there's absolutely no information out there about what happened. I mean, nothing. There is no information. And, um, you know, and kind of the story is, you know, it was Halloween, the day before Halloween. Um, she was at a party. Her daughter was at a friend's house. She calls the friend. The, the girl calls and says, hey, I don't want to stay here. I want to go home. Uh, Karen and her husband, David, were, they were separating and getting divorced, but they were still staying in the same house. And um, so... She takes the daughter home. They're laying in bed. The daughter has told the police, you know, when I went to sleep, she was laying right next to me. Well, the next morning, a motorist about a mile from her house, a motorist noticed her car on the side of the road. Well, um, 
they go to look for it. You know, they and there's diff, there's varying reports. They they found some clothes. They didn't find some clothes out there. They found some DNA on some clothes. They didn't find some DNA. And one of the biggest problems I got, and again, I'm not at all bagging on the police. I've got friend, dear friends of mine who are great police officers, do great work every day. Um, I've covered two um, uh, cases where officers were shot and killed in the line of duty. You know, uh, one in uh, Jonathan Schmidt in Truman, and an officer who got murdered over in uh, Mountain Home years ago. Uh, that was actually a national story, um, Jim Sell. And um, so I, it, it's nothing like that. But in this case, the you know, this happened in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and um, they, they are not releasing anything in this case. And it's the thing that's been interesting about Karen's case to me is that, I, it, you're not going to believe this, but there's a lot of people who, like, hate my guts. You know, like, call me up, call me everything in the book, send me emails, you know, just unbelievable. And uh, they act like it's my fault that these things happen, you know, and I write about them. So, um, so anyway, I would get a, in that case in particular, I would get a lot of blowback from people on either side because, you know, obviously her, hus her, her estranged husband at the time was there in the house. He, the police said he was the last person to see her that they know of. So, um, you know, so I was getting a lot of people who thought he could have done it or was involved or people who didn't. And I have to tell people, you know, honestly, without any information, I don't know. I mean, I've interviewed him a couple times. I mean, he's willing to take a call from me when I've tried to call him. So I have honestly don't know. And it's always strange to me because, like, um, I just report the facts. I don't make the facts up. I just report them. And every time, I mean, somebody, I can't believe you don't. You, and I'm like, well, I can't just accuse somebody of, of murder if they didn't do it. I mean, I've got to have some information. So um, I've written a short chapter about that and kind of just the nuts and bolts of what I've been able to put together for my own reporting and from what I've gotten from others. Um, but it's, I mean, my wife teaches at Walnut Ridge. Um, she was a Walnut Ridge graduate, Karen, you know, the lady um, who, who was murdered. And um, so she, had, she has a lot of friends over there and a lot of family. And I know that they've lived here in Pocahontas for a long time. I know the Swift family, um, they lived up here. And so um, I write about that a little bit um, uh, in, in that. Um, I don't think since the last time I was here, um, I, th I think I... Yeah, I think it was in August of last year. I spoke here in August. Well, right after that was the anniversary of the West Memphis Three. And um, I did a book signing in Jonesboro um, at Barnes & Noble on the anniversary of them getting released. And um, so I, uh, before I did it, you know, uh, a, a good friend of mine was like, he goes, man, if you talked to Damien Eccles right before that, that would probably just blow up like publicity wise. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. So I just called him on the phone, and sure enough, he talked to me. Um, or he, uh, I actually emailed him some questions, and he answered them. Um, but any, just a, a slight update on him. Uh, he said that he's suffering from PTSD, and he's no longer actively trying to solve the case anymore. They've wasted, they've spent millions of dollars. You know, they've spent lots of time. Um, and his wife told me, she said, it's time for the state of Arkansas to step up to the plate and get this case solved. And um, for anybody. Now, I know every now and then there's people who have doubts, you know, like Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. confessing. Um, and I won't go through all the details of the case. I, I know most, almost everybody here knows the details. Although, I did meet somebody the other day who knew nothing about it, who was actually from Arkansas, which was really crazy. Um, but just to tell you the mindset of a Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., <laughs> okay, so he, by a stroke of luck, is not in prison right now. I mean, literally... Anybody else in the world would still be in prison. So he can go back to jail for jaywalking. I mean, they could get him for anything. He can't do anything wrong. Well, he has been caught several times driving around West Memphis in a car with no license, no registration, no insurance, no headlights at night. I mean, and I, I'm not talking just once. Of course, I call the prosecutor. I'm like, hey, you go put him back in prison, and I won't tell you what. At the end of the explicative laced tirade, he goes, of course not, because <laughs> he doesn't want to go through that again. So anyway, just as a, I guess that's just another caveat. I mean, just so you can understand his mentality of a guy who, um, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I was reading this police report. He was driving around at 10 o'clock at night with no headlights on a Saturday night. I mean. 
And so there was this mug shot, you know, where he, would, he had to go to jail for the weekend, and then they let him out. I mean, it's just insane. So anyway, um, I guess that's a little bit of an update on that. Um, I've got another really fun story if you want to hear that. Yes. Okay, well, um, does anybody remember the show, I think those cartoons, um, uh, Schoolhouse Rock? Mm -hmm. Conjunction, Junction, What's Your Function, A Bill is a Bill. <coughs> the guy who wrote those, sang those, and performed those is from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. he, uh, his name is Bob Durer. And um, a few months ago I thought, man, it would be really neat to, to interview him. So I spent months trying to find this guy. Couldn't find him anywhere. He grew up in Cherry Hill during the 30s, during the Depression. He's 94, 95 years old. So um, finally I get on, I found an old like website or something. It had an email address on there. And I thought to myself, how many people change their email address? And I emailed him. A few days later, he emails me back. He's like, hey, it was Bob, you know? And uh, I said, so you want to do a story sometime? He's like, ah, not really, you know, kind of give me a, blowing me off. I'm like, okay, fine. So finally, one morning, he just decides he wants to do it. I'm literally laying in bed playing with a dog. He's like, I said, I'll give you 15 minutes. I said, okay. So Bob, before he became famous for that, um, had written songs for Miles Davis, you know, the all-time great jazz trumpeter, you know, um, maybe the greatest jazz musician of all time. He'd written songs with him, uh, worked with him. He had worked with Sugar Ray Robinson, um, the old boxing champ. They used to do these barnstorming tours, you know, Sugar Ray, he would retire from boxing, and they would get all these celebrities together, and they would just go to different towns, and, you know, like, it was just a show that they would put on. So he went to Toronto and Paris, all of a sudden, he was kind of like a creative director for him, so he was hanging out with all these people. Well, in 1971, I think, an ad executive called Bob up and said, Hey, can you write a song? My son can remember any Rolling Stones song, but he can't learn his multiplication tables. <laughs> yeah. So he said, um, uh, he said, can you write me a song? He goes, I've got some jingle writers, but jingle writers is kind of like, it's like, three, it's like finger licking good. So it's just a jingle. It's not a real song. He goes, I want a song. And he goes, okay. So he wrote the song, Three is the Magic Number. And as soon as that ad executive heard it, he goes, we're going to make an album of these. So they make an album. And Michael Eisner, who went on to become the CEO at Disney, you know, the big, you know, when Disney blew up in the 80s and 90s, he hears Three is the Magic Number. And he was the programming director at ABC at the time. And he said, I can turn those into cartoons. So he hires Bob. And they hire a whole creative team, and so they start writing all these songs, you know, Conjunction Junction, A Bill is a Bill. And um, so they create all of all of the stuff. Well, so Bob would go all over the world performing these things. And Bob was a great jazz pianist. Like, he was a just a fantastic jazz pianist. And so, um, anyway, about the 15-minute mark, I mean, dead on, he goes, Georgia promised you 15 minutes. I said, yes, you did. He goes, have a good day. You know, I got my <laughs> Yeah. So I sit on the story for about a week, week and a half. I can't remember exactly how long. And um, I was literally watching the news, and he died. Oh. Yeah, I was the last person to interview him, and I hadn't even written the story yet. So um, I wrote the story, and um, I, you know, I talked to like you know some people from the Jazz Hall of Fame. I mean, he he would actually um, just a couple weeks before he died, he was ninety four. Just a couple weeks before he died, he was still going and playing in clubs. And so, uh, anyway, that's my other fun story. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Do you know anything about the J.D. Ward uh, uh, death? I think it was from Marshall a few years ago. She supposedly fell off the porch oh, yeah. and killed her. And uh, I think it was a writer for the Democratic Gazette. I think it was Mike Masterson. Maybe? Mike Masterson, you know, really wrote a lot of stuff about that case. Yeah. Her dad died the other day. And, oh, uh, gosh. Not ever knowing exactly what happened to her. You know, he always believed she was murdered. I yeah. don't know if he knew anything about that case. Yeah. I've, I, I mean, I've, just what I've read in the Democrat Gazette, I mean, but yeah, she, allegedly they were like at a log cabin or some house and they were having a party. And she fell off like a six inch step and broke her neck, which was like physically impossible for, I think she was 17 or something like that. It just made no sense at all. And I guess he was, 
and I always, this is the thing about being a reporter too. Sometimes you're, there's things that they can tell you on the record, and then there's like, okay, then you turn it and they're like, listen, this is what really happened. We can't prove it, but this is what happened. And so I would imagine, I've never talked to him about this case, I've seen him before, um, down when I was at ATN a couple times, but I would imagine he's, to be as passionate about that case as he is, he has some insight that's beyond just what's in the public record. <coughs> But yeah, I'm aware of it. I don't know much about it, though. I know he, he, they always, he implied that it was somebody high up in the, uh, oh yeah, somebody important. Right, right. <laughs> that was kind of keeping it under wraps, you know. So it, it was just sad that he, her, her, her dad was very adamant about trying to find out what happened, and he never got to, you know, he never got closure with it. So he just passed away probably a few weeks ago. See, and I'm afraid of that. And case like this, mm -hmm. or Amanda's case, I'm afraid that, you know, it's going to get to a point where uh, a parent will go to their grave not knowing what happened to their kid. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's right. I mean, if, if anything could possibly be done to stop it, you know. Do you have the Karen Swift case solved in your mind? No. Um, I mean, I, there, it was shocking to me the lack of facts. I mean, because, you know, like, you know, I don't just rely on what I report. Like, I tried to get a hold of the sheriff over there a bunch, and he was always obfuscating, coming up with excuses not to talk. Then when I asked questions, he wouldn't answer any of them. Basic stuff. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty damning detail that if you're an estranged husband, you're the last person to see her. But it's not a definitive detail. I mean, she could have gotten in that car and left. And, you know... And, I, and part of the chapter, I, and I do go into this, um, there were a couple of, of uh, murders of blonde-headed women in that part of West Tennessee. There were several cases um, over the course of several years. Holly Bobo, I'm sure you guys remember that case, because yeah. that case is absolutely heinous. I mean, you can't even, it is one of the worst. If you read what some of those guys said they did to that poor girl, it is unbelievable. Um, but I kind of came away thinking that they're really not connected. I mean, they seem connected because they have some deep, you know, some blonde-headed women, but I just don't think they're connected. Um, they may be, but at this point, with no facts, I try not to have opinions without facts. How did they figure she died? I don't remember. Was there a... Um, I want to say it was blunt trauma. I think it, what it was. Her, they found her body several months after the fact, and that always um, complicates, you know. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, I believe it was blunt trauma is what got her. Couldn't remember that. Have what? you ever done any research on the three boys from West Memphis? The, uh, the West Memphis Three? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the first book I wrote, and I talked about that some. Um, I, I interviewed those guys when they were still in prison. Um, I, I was working out of Memphis at the time that happened, and I had a house there at Marion, and I was, before they had ever even made the arrests on it, you know, everybody was county up tight until they actually said we think we've got them or made some address there. It was pretty nerve-wracking there for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I was in high school at the time, but I remember it. Well, there's been a lot happened since they went to prison, and they've all got out and whatnot. And do you think they actually were involved in this? Oh, no, no. That there's no... Uh, there, I, I would say, like I spoke to you guys last year, and of course I wrote a book where I said I really, I don't think they did it back in 2016. But even as time passes, like when I tell you what Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. is out doing, I mean, give me a break. I mean, this guy is not a credible witness. I mean, come on. I mean, and, um, I mean, people, I think that it's starting to happen where people realize that false confessions do happen. They are a thing. I mean, it's happened. People falsely confess. Um, I spoke at Kiwanis and Young Girl oh, 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 not too long ago, and it's kind of funny because if you, the problem some people have, like, I, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of times prosecutors, police officers, even just like attorneys in general, they get blinders. They start to believe something, and then nothing else makes sense to them, and they have to stay on that path no matter what. And I've seen it happen a bunch. I mean, and they, you can't, you cannot present them enough facts. Well, at some point, the avalanche. In the 20 years since that happened, every single thing that had, every single fact that has come out in that case, from DNA through people saying I lied on the stand, 
um, through uh, finding new evidence that somebody else is involved, through finding alibis for all these people, and then just a general, the way they act, everything has come back that those guys didn't do it. And I think I told you guys this the last time I was here. One thing that you, the thing that is, to me, was the turning point for me in that case was around this country there are people who, um, who are in a similar situation where, like, they're not as nationally known, but locally people are like, I don't really think that person committed this crime. Well, what started happening in the mid-2000s when this fine mitochondrial DNA testing came out is some people wanted to test it and others didn't. And the reason is is because if you're guilty, you don't want to test it because then it will definitively prove that you're, you were involved in that murder. So what happened in this case? All three of them said, test. Test everything. Damien Eccles, to my face, when he was still on death row, said, test every damn thing in this case. I don't care. Test it all. And if he was innocent or if he was guilty, trust me, if you, if you have a good attorney, he's going to tell you, don't. <laughs> because um, and I think I said this before, too, and I'll say it again. You know, we think about those three guys as three separate people. Or we think of them as one thing, but they're actually legally three separate people. And I have to think, and Linda, you can back me up on this, I would have to think that a good attorney would take Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin or Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. into a room and say, look, you guys are perceived to be innocent. You're getting all these millions of dollars and all this notoriety because of public perception. But here's the thing. you talking to Damian. What if Jesse really was involved? And they find one of his hairs. And it, it's DNA tested. Guess what? You don't get convicted in a court of law because of that. But you get convicted in the court of public yeah, opinion. I thought about that. that yeah, it sense. destroys your case. Yeah, it just because if, if they found a hair from Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., anybody who thought they were innocent go, wait a minute. They just step back and go, probably wrong about this. Even though they barely knew each other. Right. They really weren't friends with Jesse. They were not. They were not friends. Hmm. When is your book due to come out? I'm going to try to, uh, this is the other thing, I'm going to try to, to marry it, um, to, to come out when the Discovery Channel starts our podcast series mm -hmm. in October. It'll be done by then. Um, actually, I had a, I just moved into a new house, and I'm never, ever doing that again. I, <laughs> I mean, God, that sucks. Are you going to go back to Barnes & Noble with that new book? Yes. In Jonesboro? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I will, will we have copies to sell here? Absolutely. I'll make sure, and I apologize. I, I literally, I, I stewed on this for a couple of weeks, and I thought, you know what? It, this case is getting so hot that they're having, they're, the detectives are literally going back and interviewing people again, like within the last week. I got a call that said, hey, you didn't hear this from me, but guess what? And I'm like, okay. So literally, I, I didn't want to come out of the book, and like literally the next day, you know, they solved this case. Which, which case is that? The Rebecca Gould case. Oh, Rebecca Gould. Yeah. Uh, what county was she from? She was from Mountain View. Her body was found in Izzard County. Okay. Um, her, uh, she was uh, lab. The, the house that she was murdered in is in a little town called Guyon. And um, I always wondered how to pronounce that. That one that looks like Gwyn or something. It, it, Gion or something. I don't know. I, I, they call it Guyan down there. I so Gion, I, yeah. I just call it whatever they call it. I don't want to make anybody mad. <laughs> when you research these, do you actually go out and look for people who actually knew the people and talked to them? Together? Oh, yes. Um, and like in Amanda Tessing's case, um, I tried to get a hold of her parents. Um, I sent them some Facebook messages, and I'm respectful. A lot of them don't want to. Sometimes I want to talk, sometimes I don't. And then I talked to the lead detective, Gary Edder, who uh, he is friends with uh, uh, Amanda's uh, parents. And he sent them a message. He, he told me that I said, hey, tell them that I want to talk to them. If they don't want to talk, I understand. And it's kind of one of those phenomenons like Dr. Gould. Sometimes he really wants to talk about this. Then I'll go, I'll go six months and not hear. He just doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want to think about it. And I know him well enough, I've known him for years, I know him well enough that we're, we're truly friends, and so I can see the ups and downs that he goes through. So if I hit, a lot of times, I'll, if I hit somebody when they're in a down spot, I just leave them alone. I'm not harassing anybody, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Was, was uh, Amanda's brother named Adam? I believe so, yes. Andy. Andy, Andy, Andy that's right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I said this, you know, having a twin brother who's, like, way bigger than you, she's used to, you know, dealing with, you know, dealing very, dealing with a man. You know, if you have a twin brother, that's a, you know, you know big monster, you know, and you're a little tiny girl, then you had to deal with that guy. So, um, yeah. I think <coughs> She was 
was? She was five. Yeah. What was she, about five feet tall? If that. If that. Yeah. And I have a daughter who's 4'11", plus my daughter just started college today, so that was extremely uh, What's the word? Stressful and extremely sad. <laughs> At 2.30 in the morning, I'm not going to lie to you guys, at 2.30 in the morning, I was sitting in her room last Aww. night. Yeah. yeah, I was looking uh, at all of her stuffed animals. I'm re I was remembering each and every one of where I bought it and where I gave it to her. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, I might have another story. I don't know. <laughs> I can make one up. <laughs> I told him, I told a county judge one time, or I didn't tell him. Um, this is actually a pretty, pretty funny story. So I started working at the Baxter Bulletin, and uh, they had a county judge over there. And uh, there was a reporter who worked at the at the um, the Bulletin, and uh, he had written a story with the county judge. And we were him and I were walking through the courthouse lobby, and the county judge walks up to us, and he's like. He goes up to me, he goes, hey, he goes, you wrote a story about me the other day. He goes, I wasn't even in town. <laughs> he goes, you put quotes in there for me, I didn't even talk to you. And the reporter looked at him and he goes, trust me, if you had been in town, this is what you would have said. <laughs> 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 All right, well, let's give him a hand. <laughs> I brought a few just in case because I was going to bring a few to the bookstore. I've got a few if you need them. Christmas around the corner, you know, nothing that says Merry Christmas like murder mayhem. So. All right, very quickly let me tell you about we've got three of these left. Next week is about Baptist education in Northeast Arkansas. Uh, September 10th is going to be about World War I. And September 17th, Jake Foster is going to talk to us about supermarkets. All right. No kidding. How did Mr. Blevins do the other night? Brooks? No, he, not, he wasn't here this time. Oh, was he, did he not? Oh, I, thought yeah. he, I thought he was on here. We will be having him at Williams Baptist sometime later this semester. Okay, he's a former professor of mine and oh, a okay. really great guy. Yep. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.